meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. <laughs> uh, Brittany, should we get started? Or do you want to wait a few minutes for, for people to join the stream? Okay. All right, we'll get started. This is the Sustainable Fashion Forums Fashion Horror Stories series. And uh, this is a conversation about amplifying the voices of garment workers to build a resilient supply chain. Um, we have many guests here. And uh, let's see, uh, Manpreet, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Manpreet Kalra. I'm an anti-racism educator, um, host of Art of Citizenry podcast, and brand marketing expert on a mission to decolonize storytelling. And I'm just really glad to be here and part of this awesome panel. So I'll pass the mic over. Okay. Uh, Guy. Hi, I'm Guy Stewart. Uh, I am running something called the Garment Worker Diaries, which is uh, a survey of garment workers in Bangladesh um, that takes place every week. And uh, we talk to 1,300 workers in the main uh, garment producing areas in Bangladesh. In more than one city or, or just in Dhaka? Uh, Dhaka and its suburbs, and then also in, in uh, Chittagong or Chattagong. Wow, that's quite a project. Okay, uh, Aisha. Hi everyone, I'm thrilled to be here. My name is Aisha Berenblad. I have spent some 15 years working on labor rights and human rights on the inside of the fashion industry. In my current incarnation, I run Remake. Uh, we are focused on educating everyday shoppers on the dark side of fast fashion and giving you practical tips on how to buy less and better. Um, in the context of COVID, we've currently been running the now viral pay up campaign to assure that workers are paid for their labor and not forgotten during this difficult time. Thrilled to be here. Oh, well, hang on. What, what are the top tips there that you're, you're putting out a lot of tips? What, what are the best tips? I mean, I'd say, you know, the number one thing to be sustainable is to be naked, right? <laughs> not wear any clothes at all, shop in your closet, rewear what you want over and over again. Uh, but when it comes to actually shopping mindfully and sustainably, it's making sure that we're centering people and the planet first. And so on our platform, Remake.World, we give a seal of approval to brands that are really thinking about human rights, and environmental justice hand in hand. Um, and so, you know, if you want to discover better brands, I know there's a few on this very panel, um, check out our site. Okay, speaking of James, hi. Oh, you're muted. Hi everybody, James Bartle is my name and um, I'm the founder and CEO of a denim brand called Outland Denim. And uh, we work in Cambodia and our, our mission has been to give employment and training and education to women that have been trafficked or um, exploited in one way or another. Great. Um, how do you go about that mission? Well, it comes, it comes down to, to really the, the employment opportunities. So we, we find women that are um, exploited or sold, trafficked into other countries, uh, into other garment factories, um, a range of different kinds of exploitation. Um, and our, our goal is to be able to equip them with everything they need to be successful on their own so that they can be independent and no longer dependent on um, even us, just that they have the skills, the education um, to be able to be successful and go out and thrive in the world. And do you work with non-governmental organizations to, to find them? We do, yeah. So we, we'll have NGOs come and recommend um, young ladies that, that have been exploited, that need opportunity, need help. Um, they could have just been somebody that's severely poor on the street, poverty being the greatest contributor to making um, these people vulnerable So um, to that kind of exploitation. So it's a, it's a really important step. And without this, this step, um, the cycle continues. Okay. And uh, Katerina, would you please introduce yourself? Um, hello, good evening. Very nice to be here. Well, um, I don't have a past in fashion. Actually, my, my, my previous career has been in development aid. I've always been dealing with uh, women's rights, especially in North Africa and Middle East. And 10 years ago, I created my own brand. It's called See Me. And we do something very similar to, similar to what 
uh, our other panelists just said, we hire and create employment opportunity for women survivors of violence. And my interest started uh, when uh, I evaluated, or evaluated when, uh, when I faced the incredible gender issue that all across the industry from all the different levels is, uh, is, is, is increasing. And uh, whenever I had it to start uh, uh, putting my hands and trying to find a solution, indeed, no charity, just work was the motto that we, we, we found our company, our brand, uh, upon. So North Africa, uh, especially right after the Arab Spring, had had uh, left a lot of um, unemployment and incredible uh, dairy situation, especially uh, the women uh, in, in the rural area and in the poor urban area. And so we started an employment campaign and we created training opportunities and employment opportunities for and we joined forces, uh, Charles, just like you just asked. We joined forces with local NGOs that run shelter home for uh, single mothers, and uh, they have had babies out of the out of the wedlock, and women that are survivors of domestic violence. So we strike a partnership with with the two of them that are operating in Tunis, in Tunisia right now, and uh, we create employment opportunity for as many girls as possible. And now we are standing also in other um, country in North Africa. And we were the first one to be fair trade certified in the region and creating a, an opportunity for more brand to source ethically and to source in a fair manner, being assured that the way employment and the way uh, labor rights are considered are up to the highest standards of human rights. And before we move on, so anybody who's confused by the term NGO, that's non-governmental organization, which is basically a big international charity. And there's a lot of them that work with the United Nations um, and they, they do a lot of work that's hidden. It, it's, um, it's great that, that you all are helping them accomplish their goals. Well, actually, uh, uh, what you said, we... What you said, you know, they are very much based on philanthropy, often based on philanthropy and, and charity. What creates, in my experience, and I think also in the experience of the other panelists on long-term sustainability, financially and economically, is jobs. Having fair uh, labor rights, fair labor conditions, and being able to, to rely on, on a steady salary is what creates uh, the basis for women, in my case, to to be able to to build their life on and to create a better future for themselves and for their children. Wonderful. Okay. Um, and before we we move into our, our first segment here, um, I'm Charles Beckwith. I'm the host of American Fashion Podcast, which has been on a little bit of a hiatus for the summer, but we'll we'll be back pretty soon. Um, I've worked with Save the Garment Center as the director of communications here in New York City, and um, I worked with the Manufacturing New York project while that was going on when we we're trying to bring garment manufacturing back to the United States. Um, certainly, we're seeing a lot of changes in the New York City Garment Center right now, um, especially with the, the changing cost of um, the commercial real estate, because a lot of garment factories were, were threatened by you know, tech offices and, and law offices moving into the spaces they traditionally occupied. Um, and that threat may be changing, which is kind of wonderful. Um, so I want to shift over and talk to Annie from the Garment Worker Center, who's going to speak with Yeni, who is a garment worker. Uh, so first things first, let, let's talk to somebody who's been on the ground. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Annie Shaw, and I'm uh, the outreach coordinator at Garment Worker Center. Uh, very briefly about what Garment Worker Center is. We are a worker center that's led by garment workers that um, are working in the Los Angeles garment industry. Um, there are 45,000 garment workers today working in Los Angeles, um, producing majority fast fashion, but also sustainable fashion as well. Um, I think it's important to name that when a piece of clothing is says is made in USA, it's actually often made in LA because Los Angeles and California still has the largest remaining garment production in the United States. 
So in that context, I want to introduce our amazing leader, Yenny Dewey, who has been leading um, with us for over five years at uh, GWC and share a little bit of her knowledge of the industry and story. So Yenny, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself first? Hi everyone, my name is Yenny Dewey. I am a garment worker and mother of three kids, uh, originally from Indonesia. I work in this industry on 2013 as a, a sewing operator. Mm -hmm. in, this, in this industry, uh, I was um, I was facing with the wage step, uh, but uh, uh, the company don't pay me for three weeks. Then I find the Garment Workers Center, the organization who's um, um, teach and and. Uh, uh, organized the garment uh, worker in the Los Angeles. So I've been uh, with the garment uh, worker center from 2015 as a member. And then I learned my rights. Then I uh, try to figure out what happened with, it, with this industry. Even I work uh, like long ago uh, as a garment worker they pay still uh, low wages and then uh, the the wages is done not enough for for living wage uh, for Benny, can you tell us how much you were getting paid in the first company they pay me for 55 hours is 125 because that time i don't know uh how it was supposed to be i get because mm -hmm. i don't uh, either a uh, communication with the other worker and then I don't get any information. So the company just pay me 125 for 55 hours. I think that's enough for me. But when I uh, be a member, that's <laughs> that's not a right to pay uh, like that because uh, supposed to be, is uh, supposed to be uh, they pay um, uh, per hour, but at that time, I don't understand uh, about my right. So uh, I think uh, because uh, I either uh, um, uh, undocumented in the time, so I don't uh, I don't uh, complain a lot. So I'm uh, in the situation I was scared. So uh, after after I know my my right and learn in the government uh, worker center. So there's a lot of discrimination and then a lot of, um, um, uh, yes, like a harassment that I don't, I, 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 as a, I, as a government worker, uh, I think the, the government worker is, is, um, it's the same a worker as the, like a restaurant and, and the other worker, but why in this industry we 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 feel separated by the law from uh, from the government? Like the other worker pay by an hour, but the, the government worker pay by piece rate. This uh, uh, from yeah. that we try to uh, to fix the uh, the law, AB six three three, and then yeah. Yeah, well, we can talk about that later about how right what we're trying to change. Um, I, I want to give make sure we give time to other folks to talk about the conditions as well. But can you just talk about like a little bit just explain what it looks like in Los Angeles, in the United States, in a shop like in a factory, right? Like, like, so you were getting paid $120 for a week, right? Yeah. And, I, and that's not uncommon. That's actually most people, right? And then what yeah. does the factory look like? Yeah, and the, I came from the uh, Asian a third country. When I came here to the big city in Los Angeles, I thought it's better than Asian uh, Asian uh, factory in the garment industry. But mm -hmm. when, uh, when I work as a garment industry a garment worker in this industry, I will have to bring my own uh, stool. I have. I have to uh, bring needles, bobbin, and my own self. Not not the company uh, prepare for that. Oh, yeah, I so when I when I uh, when I work in this industry, uh, the the company is a small company. A small company. Uh, the door is closed. Um, the 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 
uh, the working place is dirty and I have to bring my own toilet paper on water for drinking. Mm. So every single worker have to bring the borrower water put in down the machine and then the toilet paper for my uh, uh, self use it. Mm. I, I, I don't uh, I don't know that's maybe because I knew in here in that time so I just follow it. So yeah. then then when I find it uh, and the the, uh, the fabric, uh, put in the floor on the floor and then the red uh, the the rotten goes around because there a uh, worker some throw the food or something like that is this the place is so nasty and then i uh, uh, i was uh, working in the several company like in the random company the the place is the same thing hiding small and then uh, dirty so uh it's not comfort working in the garment industry. Uh, and uh, in the summertime, mm -hmm. uh, sweating, like we just grab some uh, fabric, just clean up myself. And then I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't uh, imagine when right now with the COVID situation in the, in the garment industry is more than a dirty place and then uh, spreading with the uh, virus, so that what I what I what I uh, um, my experience in the garment industry in, in the big city Los Angeles. Yeah, thank you, Yeni. And you know, when we have a moment later, let's also talk about how we're changing it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Yeni. So um, I kind of want to point back to. Uh, Something that happened in 1911 here in New York City, March 25th, 1911, mm -hmm. was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in Greenwich Village. Um, if you walk around the New York University campus right there at Washington Square Park, there's a little plaque on the building um, where the, the original building was, and, and hundreds of people died. They were locked into their factory. Um, and that continues to be a problem. That was the problem... Uh, when the the uh, Rana Plaza building collapsed, um, there's a, a lot of issues around workers' rights. Um, but then this is also a business, and, and you have business ethics to consider. Um, so a basic question is, what rights should garment workers have? Um, and should those be a matter of law or is that a matter for brands to decide amongst themselves? And how, how do we make sure that, that there's compliance with the basics? I mean, the basics of having toilet paper in a factory, that's, that's a crazy thing that um, they know they're exploiting you. Um, it, it's so clear, but why are the, are they, is that pressure from the top? Is that the big brands demanding lower prices for the wholesale? Um, Aisha, do you have a perspective on this you'd like to share? Yeah, absolutely, Charles. You know, one of the things that Yanni has so eloquently painted for us in terms of what's happening in LA actually happens worldwide. And I think it's sort of really important for people listening in to know that there are good and bad factories everywhere. You know, we've heard from Katrina and James and from some of the work that Guy does in whether Cambodia or North Africa, time and time again, it's almost like playing whack-a-mole, right? We have these issues and then there's a media story that breaks out and then we end up some somewhere else where we're hearing these pervasive issues of rock bottom wages, unsafe working conditions, harassment and discrimination of a predominantly female workforce. And to your question on, well, what will it take? I mean, I think the writing is on the wall that here we are a quarter century later of voluntary efforts, 30 years of brands saying, we're going to guard ourselves with through codes of conduct, through voluntary efforts, and we have just not come far enough. And so within Remake, we have actually launched a coalition working with frontline labor organizations 
organizers as well as garment workers themselves. The Garment Worker Center here in LA is a part of it, as well as colleagues and organizers from Cambodia to Bangladesh and beyond to say, what is the future of fashion? What's the vision that we need? And we're very clear that what we're needing is to center workers. This is about you know, good business practices, not about philanthropy. We must start and end the conversation with living wages. And the way to really achieve that is through regulation. And I know Annie can talk well about Senate Bill 1399 here, um, you know, and how important it is to pass that. But I think world over, we're starting to have these conversations, both in sending and receiving countries, you know, whether it's the European Union Mandatory Due Diligence Act, whether it's thinking about some of the due diligence that France and Germany are trying to pass, or social protection laws, be it in Indonesia or Vietnam, to say, you know, companies are constantly looking for places to explore exploit loopholes. And what we have built essentially is an industry with a race to a bottom. We are getting our clothes too quickly uh, for too little money that end up in landfills anyways. And the only way to really eradicate and uproot um, when it comes to these endemic and systemic human rights issues is to pass better regulation. Yeah, um, especially regulation on imports because um, there's not much we can do when they keep moving things. I mean, we, we've seen China's labor costs rose, and so they started investing in Africa, and now they've built all these giant garment factories in Africa, um, which then also have to be tracked. But the mechanisms for tracking garment labor exploitation are in Bangladesh and China and Vietnam. So now we have to move the tracking um, and, you know, Ethiopia is one of the lowest paid garment workers in the world. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they make an average of $26 a month. And so there's only one reason the industry fled as Cambodia started to shore up its protections to Ethiopia. It wasn't because of the infrastructure. It was because it, these are the lowest way paid garment workers in the world currently. Yeah, um, it kind of. I'm, I'm thinking of two presidents named Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, a lot of the the kind of painting over of issues that the fashion industry does seems to be the speak softly, but they they, they don't ever want the big stick. They don't want the regulation. Um, it, it seems to be necessary. I mean, we, we've heard so many times that um, you have these certifications for garment factories overseas and then you can pay $5,000 and get your certification and run your factory for years. Um, the, the, there's a lot of people still skirting the laws that, that have been set up as new policy. Um, and then, of course, uh, FDR is... If I may, so, you know, sorry. Uh, oh, well, I was going to say uh, the other President Roosevelt in 1941, State of the Union, lined it for freedoms, freedom of speech, worship, want, freedom from want, and freedom from fear and certainly the last two uh we don't tend to protect other people who are working for us around the world um in the same way that we expect to be protected here so there's we have this complacency about our freedoms in, in the united states and in europe uh, but there's vigilance required um because business you know business tends to go where things are cheap because that's their fiduciary duty and I think that, you know, this is, this kind of opens up a much larger conversation on the infrastructure that the fashion industry has been built on, right? I think that it is naive for us to not recognize the role that colonialism has played into the power dynamics that are at play when we think about the way we see um, any industry, to be perfectly honest, but it's very prevalent in fashion. And I think that you know, we have to have these conversations. I know that sometimes we get really hung up on what are the most actionable things, but I think that when we think about how do we have a, how do we really make authentic change, we have to think at a systems level. And that requires us to really go deep and understand what are the systems that are at play that we are operating in? Where do they originate from? Because many of these policies are rooted in forms of whiteness. Many of these policies are rooted in a top-down approach where you have countries in the global north 
that have significantly more power than countries in the global south, which in itself is problematic language, right? I think that we have to recognize the fact that fashion um, is built on appropriation. It is built on cherry picking um, from these communities and really extracting the goods and their industry for our own consumption. And I think one of the things that's really powerful that both Yeni and Aisha were getting at is that the reality is when we're often thinking about exploitation, we only think about people in the global south. But exploitation exists at every place, right? There is exploitation everywhere. And I think oftentimes these issues, I mean, we see this with human trafficking. People think that human trafficking is only an issue in countries of where there's dominantly people of color, right? But that's not true. Human trafficking exists in every single zip code of the United States. And I think when we start wrapping our minds around the fact that these are not just issues that are far away, these are issues that also exist close to home, we can start understanding what are those systems that allow these issues to exist. Because until we start thinking at a systems level, we're not going to be able to create authentic change. That's why we continue to think about power as power in the hands of those who have historically taken it away from the from black and brown bodies is the reality. So certainly this year, 2020, we've seen the fashion industry embrace technology in a way it had not. Um, there were a lot of technologies for tracing supply chain that just were not being used. Um, I think because a lot of older managers and executives didn't know what to do with them and didn't realize their potential. But this year has certainly opened up um, their eyes about that. Um, a lot of systems uh, for manufacturing have just been employed in the last couple of months. They, they've invested in these systems. Um, and the more transparency we have in how each piece is made, the more transparency we have on wages for workers. And it's then traceable. I mean, it's, it's data that's in a computer that can be subpoenaed. Um, Guy, the ball moves a lot. How do you track um, when to, to make a change to how you are uh, keeping an eye on, on how the, the managers are moving stuff around um, in terms of enforcement? Great, great question. Thanks, Charles. So the Garment Worker Diaries, um, we, we talk to workers every week and we talk to them in a systematic manner. We have a survey questions and we ask them particular questions each week so we can monitor what's going on each week. We also invite uh, people interested in the garment sector to put questions to the workers that they are interested in in particular. And one of the things I wanna do is invite anyone who's watching this YouTube video to contact uh, my organization um, and uh, put a question to the workers and we will put that question to them um, and get answers from a nationally representative sample of uh, 1,300 workers across Bangladesh. How do they um, contact you? I, I think that, hmm, sorry? How do, what's the best way to contact you? Um, probably um, if you want to do it, um, uh, just email me directly, Guy Stewart at mfops.org. Okay. And you do microfinance. Can you talk a little bit how that is changing um, kind of yeah, how yeah. people are empowered in other countries for, for creating businesses? Well, let me just finish finish the, the <laughs> answer to your first question and then, then I'll get to that. Um, so so what, what, because we talk directly to the workers, we're able to essentially circumvent all of the game playing that often happens in global supply chains, all of the problems that emerge in doing things like social audits, which um, can, uh, you know, have been found to often be, be highly flawed. So by speaking directly to the workers, we're able to circumvent that. And um, because we speak to them every week, we've built up a trusted channel of communication that really enables us to ask them the hard questions. Um, and so, for example, we're able to, you know, technology now, especially with digitization of wages where workers are now being paid into a bank account or a mobile money account, that's great news for transparency because you can see how much 
workers are getting paid. What you don't know is how many hours they worked. And there are lots of things that go on within the factory that mean that monitoring how many hours a worker worked is very difficult. But we ask the workers directly, how much did you get paid? And um, how many hours did you work? And what we're seeing in Bangladesh is um, right now is that a lot of the workers are, are continuing to work very long hours. They, they work six days a week and um, the regular work day is eight hours plus an hour break. So they're at work for nine hours. They sometimes will be at work for 10, 11, 12 hours. Um, and um, when you look at their wages um, compared to how many hours they work, they earn around 53 cents an hour. Okay, 53 cents an hour. Um, now, it's cheaper to live in Bangladesh, so you can multiply that by three, and that would be the US equivalent of that. So in the, if they lived in LA or Chicago, somewhere like that, it would be the equivalent of earning $1.50 an hour or $1.60 an hour. So, um, so even taking into account the cost of living, their wages um, are extremely low. And one of the ways in which they are able to survive on, on those wages is that they live in rooms that are about um, uh, six feet by six feet, seven, eight feet by eight feet, and there's one door, one window, and there's a platform bed that everyone sleeps on. Um, there's no kitchen facility in the room. Share the kitchen with nine other households. Share bathroom with nine others. Um, and so it's, it, their housing costs are actually fairly low compared to what you pay here in the US, but they're getting so much less for it. Um, so they survive and we're able to um, see how they survive, but it's, um, but it's survival at, at the sort of um, a very uh, minimal uh, standard of living. Um, I'll, 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 we'll stick with the garment industry for now. We could talk about microfinance some, some other time. Okay. If I may, there's something that you said that I wanted to push back on. I think every year, every couple of years, we have these silver bullet solutions of what's going to fix the fashion industry. Now it's all about technology and circularity. It used to be about auditing and codes of conduct. But I want to bring us back to what Manpreet said, which is really important. And that is that it is indisputable that this profitable fashion industry that's valued at $2.4 trillion. Um, there are some very clear winners, which happen to be a bunch of old white dudes who are the CEOs of this highly consolidated industry. And that this industry is built on the oppression of black and brown women, whether here in the United States or globally. And so unless we really recognize and decolonize the system for what it is, everything else is really just putting bandages on essentially it's a sinking Titanic where we keep trying to fix it with, you know, RFID codes, traceability, transparency, yet we continue to build a system on the extraction of human bodies and why we keep coming up with these issues of, you know, really long inhumane hours at rock bottom wages. And so to fix it is let's center the conversation on first of all, putting workers first. Let's talk about wages, 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 you know, enough of trying to document what they need. We've known since 1911 what's needed to your point on Triangle Shirtwitz factory. It's just that the profits are not shared equitably. And if we were to look at COVID-19, as an example of winners and losers, you know, Jeff Bezos did just fine when it comes to Amazon and Amazon, no one often thinks of Amazon as a fashion company, but it turns out their private label is really growing. Talk about a dark opaque supply chain. Mm -hmm. The CEO of Topshop is doing just fine. Meanwhile, what happened to this predominantly black and brown workforce, right? She was beaten for asking for her legally uh, owed wages from Ethiopia to the Maldives. Um, there's been COVID outbreaks from LA to Sri Lanka. You know, Guy was painting a picture for us on the shared living quarters for workers. And so you can just imagine when you're deemed that, you know, fashion is suddenly an essential work. And so you're going to go back to the factories, but you're living in shared close quarters and sharing bathrooms. And then you don't have any safety nets or healthcare. And so what we've seen here is that fashion, you know, going back to Brit's horror stories, given that it's October and Halloween is that we fail fashion's most essential workers. 
during COVID-19. And if we are to build back better and we are to really think about how this industry can be just and resilient, then we need to be centering the actual people who are the frontline workers and, and not chase after the technology silver bullet solutions. All of that is important, but they're all tools. At the end of the day, I think the question we have to ask is, is this will industry willing to share profits more equitably and protect the women who have kept it profitable for decades? It, it is not. I mean, the fiduciary duty under business ethics is that the shareholders get as much profit as possible. So unless there is a law that makes it dangerous to do something, then companies will continue to do the bad thing they can get away with because it makes more money because it's their job. So how do we, how do we change the law in that way? Yeah, I do want to jump in, though, because I think that what ends up happening is oftentimes these conversations just come down to wages and that equates human bodies to a dollar or to a number. And I think we need to stop thinking about equity in the form of just wages. I think we need to think about equity as a human right. And I think we need to think about equity as how do we, you know, Historically, in the fashion industry, supply chains have been thought of really as disposable, right? If you can't hit my price mark that I want, I'm taking my money somewhere else. And I think that if we really want to have a conversation around equity, and if we want to have a conversation around justice, we have to think beyond just dollars. We have to think beyond pay. We have to think about investing. And, you know, I think that that's where what breaks my heart is that for some reason, we have historically and continue to just equate, um, we, we continue to equate people, humans, especially people from marginalized communities with simply what can we get out of you versus actually equating them to their experience as humans. And I think that we need to genuinely change that mindset because until we start changing that, that idea that fair pay equals justice, that's, we're not going to be able to truly get true justice because it's very intersectional, right? Environmental justice is as important as economic justice, as is social justice. And so we need to understand how we have that inter intersectional approach. And so dismantling those systems is key to that because, I mean, I think that oftentimes the stories of uh, workers that we fixate on are stories of trauma. And we don't actually amplify their voices as those that have actually achieved something. We need to focus on achievements. We can't always focus on trauma. And I think that okay. that's how you create authentic change. So how do consumers approach pushing that change? What, what can consumers do when they walk into a store or when they go shopping online? What can they do that helps push that agenda? Can I speak to this one, um, Charles? Look, I think... I think okay, J James and then Annie. Yeah, yeah oh, sorry. Um, no. Look, I, I think that um, consumers do hold a lot of power, but I also, I also want to say that um, I think it's extremely unfair that a consumer needs to now become so educated mm -hmm. on uh, where a brand stands um, oh, yeah. so that I can go and shop ethically <laughs> or shop sustainably, you know? Um, I don't think it's the answer. Australia has just introduced the Modern Slavery Act, and that's a great first step uh, here in holding companies to account. And it doesn't have a whole lot of teeth yet, but it's a first step. And it's, it's been incredible to see how industry here have now started to address their supply chains because all of a sudden there's a risk if I don't. Um, that needs to happen globally. Yeah. There needs to be this, this widespread um, rollout of these kinds of um, legislations across governments and regions. Um, what, what does it require for this to happen? No. What, what does that that act require of of the companies? Oh, of, of the companies, yeah. Um, well, at the moment, it's basically they've got to be making steps toward identifying um, slavery and then doing something about it within their supply chains. Um, now, I guess the 
where it gets tricky for governments is governments have a lot of slavery within their own supply chains. And so if a, if a government um, passes a legislation through like this, then all of a sudden it becomes really difficult for itself. Um, so this is where I take my hat off to governments like the, the government in the UK and here in Australia, where they, they are willing to be active um, on solving issues like this. And so for the United States, if it was to introduce something like this, I imagine it would be a really challenging, difficult and confronting process for them to go through. Um, but I also think there needs to be um, legislation around advertising. So we're a brand who um, started not to create a fashion brand. We started to give opportunities to people that were desperate and needed it. And, and just to come back to another point where, you know, garment workers, you know, we've heard of horror stories from Guy and their living conditions, but, you know, we employ women that have come from far worse. They're, garment workers and slaves today, it's far cheaper to replace them than it is to look after them. So what that means is if they die, if they get sick, it's cheaper for them to be moved on and for them to die and get another one. Um, that is the reality of what we're talking about. And most of us don't realize that for you guys watching this YouTube, that is reality. Um, one in 130 women on the face of this planet is a slave. Can you believe that? One in 130. That is the statistic. Um, so this is a really, really serious issue that we all need to be a part of. Um, we need to be a part of it right now. Um, but apparently this, this issue is smaller um, today if we compare to the population size than it's ever been, but it's also more slaves today than there's ever been. So what it proves is it's possible for us to beat this. And really what we're talking about is, is slavery um, at, its, at its root here. And consumers can be a really big part of um, pushing this agenda by choosing carefully um, the brands that they support. Um, again, that's really unfair that they need to. There's too many certifications. There's too many audits. And all of that stuff, in my opinion, is crap. Like we need a system that works. It needs to be universal um, so that consumers can go and understand very clearly and very quickly what, what this garment stands for. And I personally would love it to say, this garment was made with slave labor rather than this garment wasn't made with slave labor. Um, and I think that would be a great identifier and I think governments should legislate that and that should become the normal so that consumers can use their dollars to make genuine change. Whereas at the moment, we've got the big brands making false statements about sustainability. That might mean they use organic cotton and then they use that one thing to uh, market to consumers and consumers believe that they're a part of the change when actually they're a part of the problem. So it's, it's not easy and it's not straightforward, but something drastic needs to happen because this is a really dire situation for millions of, millions of women around the world, 29 million women sitting in slavery right now, um, literally losing their life to um, being able to produce cheap products. Yeah, we, we know that a $5 t-shirt was made with slave labor. There, there's no formula that, you can run for the cost of labor on making a t-shirt that, that lets you make it for $5 without slave labor. So the fact that you have stores selling t-shirts for $5 should immediately trigger something, but, but we don't have that. Um, sorry, Annie. Yeah, I, I wanna give Yenny a little bit of a space to talk about why she decided to organize and fight back. Oh, great. Right? And why it's so important actually for her to do it and why for our industry. So Yenny, when, why did you decide that you and you know our um, other leaders were going to collectively organize and fight back? Um, because uh, in, uh, in, as a worker in the garment industry, certain men, they have a lot of work, um, like a bunch of work so the company uh, push the worker more for uh, more uh, work, more um, uh, quantity. Mm -hmm. they, they push the worker uh, work more, more quantity, then the price is lower. So when a certain man uh, lower work, some, uh, some work only, they, uh, they, the price is higher. That's why we, that's why I feel that's unfair for us. Mm -hmm. Supposed to be when I uh, pay by piece rent, when the bunch of work uh, coming, 
this we can make more money with with the prices but we still don't get a, a higher uh, payment because peace uh, uh, price rate is down so uh, that's why who's organized a uh, price rate who's peace rate. The, yeah peace rate who's um who's the uh, release uh, price for their price for peace so we try to find the 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 fashion uh, garment industry uh, like organization we are worker organization but there is do, we don't find it we want to asking who is put these prices because uh, when the minimum wage rise up the peace rate is still the same thing the same thing we get it from 2013 2014 15 the price is the still same the, the difference is when when the bunch work coming lower and when the small work coming is the higher. That's why uh, we we try to invite in, 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 encourage a lot of worker. Hey, this is unfair for us because we hope uh, get more money than uh, by peace rate working hard in the company, but then when payment coming or oh, uh, the piece right is like five cents is gonna be three cent a piece so it, we're losing the the money when when supposed to be we have a, a chance to get more money that's mm -hmm. why we try to to ask who's the who's the uh, organize or whose person give um um the prices in the in the in this industry we yeah. try to and also, we decided that we we're going to change the law, didn't we? We're going yeah. to change the law. After, after tired, after tired, we we try to uh, to uh, to try to make a better and complaining with the uh, company. We don't have answer, so uh, we just remain uh, remember our law twenty years ago. Don't touch it. So. Um, we uh, in the in the government uh, worker center try to oh yeah maybe we can change by a uh, policy mm -hmm. to repeal a uh, peace rate be minimum wage because by the minimum wage we we get um uh, secure the income every year uh, rise up we yeah. we don't ask like um, anything fabulous we ask only minimum wage and fair wages. That's uh, in the garment industry in big city in Los Angeles. We don't get it until now. Yeah. And, so, and, mm -hmm. the, and imagine right now a garment industry with the dirty situation and the, a separating um, um, virus, like we, um, like we, 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 we follow protocol like six feet a distance, but how about with the material we pass on the other worker? Mm -hmm. uh, like like material uh, from the uh, uh, from the other worker to the other worker. This is content with the uh, viruses. The worker is still facing with the with the COVID uh, anytime. That's make scare for the worker working in in the industry with the situation. Any. Thank you, Yenny. Yeah, and I think, you know, I want to be clear about the Garment Worker Protection Act. When I first joined GWC, and Yenny was also a new leader at that time, when we talked about ending the peace rate, that was led by workers. Organizers actually was like, I don't know whether we can ever change that, the peace rate. And it was workers that insisted that the peace rate must be changed. You know, so I think it's really important to understand without worker leadership, this industry is not going to change because they know exactly what's happening in the ground. Like what Yenny is talking about, you know, the way uh, COVID is passed by fabric and things like that, you know, and um, certainly, you know, the Bangladesh project workers diaries. But I have to say, aside from storytelling, we have to organize for power. We have to organize for power to change. And one more thing within the Garment Worker Protection Act is 
actually pushing for up the chain liability, right? So it's so multilateral that, because right I, now, yeah. only the small factory shut down, companies like Ross or H&M, they're fine. They're fine. These billion dollar companies, they're fine. So that's why multi-layer accountability is something that we're pushing for. So but has we, that act actually passed? Is that law now? It's not yet. No, it's, it's not, not yet passed. It's, um, and, is it in California it's only? This year, and then we're going back again next year. But yeah. is it it's going to be California law or, or national law? California. Yeah, it's a okay. California law. Yeah, you know, which will have a... No, go ahead and have a big impact because we are the biggest garment industry in the United States, pretty much, you know? So I think, um, but I did really want to name that sometimes even, right, we are in the organizing complex and there are times that we're like, oh, I don't know, you know, should we be changing piece rate? And it was the workers that come back again and again. It's like, no, this needs to be changed. They know where they're losing money. Yeah. I think okay. something that you said, Charles, was really important, right? Which was to say, look, companies from the goodness of their hearts are not going to do anything because at the end of the day, especially if you're a publicly traded company, a Fortune 500, a Fortune 1000, your first priority is investors and shareholders. And certainly in COVID-19, we saw that, right? Where as early as March, brands started to en masse cancel orders that were already stitched, that were in production or had even been shipped um, in order to save supply, uh, supply chain savings so that they could have enough of balance uh, cash on their balance sheets so that they could have a good second quarter. You know, sales were already plummeting. No one was buying anything but perhaps sweatpants at home. You know, stores were closed because of shelter in place. And so the industry was very clear around who they have to put front and center here, which was the investors and shareholders. And so a lot of companies that we've been campaigning against to pay up that haven't paid up going back to orders in March and April had quite a nice second quarter and can we continue to have this conversation in the third quarter and so to your point of what listeners can do you know I almost hate the word consumer because it sort of puts us in that bucket of that's all we have to do we have to somehow consume ourselves into a sustainable future but if people were really to recast themselves as citizens, you know, in the stopgap measures till we get better regulation passed, knowing that that is the silver bullet and where we have to go, um, citizens can really rise up to hold the industry accountable. And to Guy and James' yeah. earlier point is to create risk. You know, $40 billion worth of orders were canceled at the start of this year. And it was through relentless campaigning and influencers and citizens really rising up, taking over Twitter and Instagram comments to brands to say, pay up, pay up, pay up. I don't care about your flash sale. That at this point, we have had 22 brands that have committed to pay up and to uh, essentially pay those contracts meant that workers were paid. So I think there is a way to Annie's point of organizers and everyday people to you up in solidarity, but for us to remember that the people we have to center in this conversation is workers first. I want to go back to Katarina. Um, Kendra, can you talk about what your fight is right now? What, what are you trying to accomplish in the next couple of months? Well, first of all, survival, just like any brand that is basically working on an ethical basis, just like us. Don't forget that COVID, as, uh, as in, in this part of the world I live in, the Netherlands, has been uh, providing through government, we have been providing through government to, to some support. But workers in the South, in North Africa, especially in the area where I'm at, where I'm working, they have received no kind of support of in any in any form so everything has been shut down the lockdown has been really severe in north africa it's an argument that's been ob not even spoke about and the re the result we are we are seeing them right now charles we have a serious issues of bankruptcy and survivals so i personally have been, have been using my savings to to make sure that my workers had 100 percent salary guaranteed every month because they don't have any other social parachute or any other background to fall on. That's a survival and it is exactly what they're all about. But one, one thing I'd like to, to put the accent on, it's alternative 
way of producers. I absolutely agree with Aisha and what everybody has been saying that this situation, the structure that fashion system has been uh, built on to create more profit is macabre in the least, absolutely. There, has, there is a stronger movement that started 15 years ago that is the fair trade movement of ethical movement doesn't matter whether it's certified or not, but there's an alternative to that that is based on putting forward the well-being of the workers and the well-being of everybody that is involved in the operation of the brand. And this ethical sourcing is growing. I can tell you from, a, if you want to, on a positive note, I can tell you there are more and more uh, workers that are joining the fair trade movement and that are even if for marketing reason uh, or for whatever other reason, they have been solicited by brands to start producing for them. So uh, ethical sourcing is a fact. It's not been happening much in the past 10 years, but I'm absolutely positive that after COVID it's gonna be a bigger source of fair income for more people, especially for more women. And uh, we personally have been partnering with quite some uh, brand in the luxury industry. There's going to be a new partnership coming up, back to survival, that is essential. And we made very sure that we are going to produce some of their products, some of their items, but we are not going to back up on any, any of the ethical principles that are the basis of everything we do, including whenever they push us for having lower prices, lower GOGS, refusing the order because that's very important if they want to use our stories if they want to use the fact that these beautiful products are made and by, by women in distress in another part of the world we have not to back up on how much they are ready to pay us so how often does that happen i mean that sounds crazy but but i'm sure it does happen the 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 stores are saying to you an ethical brand we love your ethical story but can you can we pay you less oh, 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 oh yes definitely the, i don't know if you're aware of the fact that whenever you put a a, a, a product in a store 60 percent of the end price net from the vat goes to the to the retailers that means we have left 40 percent. that's a rule of the market so the middle way, the price uh, uh, augmentation that starts from th that, uh, um, that you find when you end up in a retail store are incredibly high. You have to understand that a luxury uh, product is obtained, the price of a luxury product is obtained by multiplying 10 to 15 times the production cost, all right? So when you get to a, some, when you buy something that in a store is hundred dollars. The price that has been was original was ten dollars, and all the things in between go into marketing, go into retail, go into management, go into everything you want to know. So even us, when we are approached by brand to to as a, to become uh, in, for, even for co-branding or to be a, a, an ethical producer for them, they are asking to reduce our prices. And yeah. that's where you have to say no. And that's where I think the, the um, I'm part of the World Fair Trade Organization, which is a, um, an organization that puts together producer. And we feel stronger when we are together to pay up, I mean, to, to set up to, to the brands and remain on our costs without compromising it. Okay. So um, ethical so sourcing is an opportunity. And I think it's gonna, yeah. it's gonna retain it's going to be an alternative very viable in the future. And uh, for any brands that are listening, I want to point out uh, Lisa Morales Halibo has a wonderful organization called the Worldwide Supply Chain Federation, um, which is working on this problem. And, and if you want to want help on ethical sourcing, uh, that's a very good place to start. Um, so kind of coming to the end here, um, often in the last couple of years, people have said, well, um, we should educate consumers so they know that they should buy ethical things. But, but in scientific testing, we found that even if they know something is ethical, if the unethical thing is a dollar less, they're, they're usually going for the thing that's a dollar less. They, they won't make that choice. But, but if you as a consumer care about this, the thing you can do, uh, especially right now, is vote. Uh, vote for people 
who will make these changes, um, who will make it law that um, the ethical thing has to be the thing that you do. Um, I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, we're at the top of the hour here at the end of our time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your contributions here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I wanted to give a special shout out to Yenny for taking time. Oh, yes, absolutely. Today. You know, so happy to have you here. And thank you, everyone.